Hello world, and we are back. My name's Kyle Fischel, and this is going to be episode 83 of my poker vlog. Today I'm going to cover a session from a trip I took to Jacksonville to play on the Best Bet live stream. I'm going on an adventure! Played a bunch of interesting hands, and we're going to get right into them. Alright, first interesting hand. I'm under the gun with pocket eight. I raised to $20. This is pretty much the bottom of my under the gun opening range, but we're definitely gonna include most pocket pairs into it. Well, after three callers, the small blind happens to wake up with a premium and raise to $205. Definitely a massive raise. A raise of that size pretty much screams ace X, especially from the small blind specifically, because usually if your opponent had like strong premium high pocket pairs they wouldn't need to go that big they can go like 125 150 maybe this one seems to be so large it looks like it's more of a protection but either way this hand is very very early into the stream session so no reason to get two out of line just yet we can happily just give this one up and wait for a better spot i include this hand because the flop would have had me flop extremely extremely well the action goes pretty crazy to the point where I probably got a full double up. So you should never be results oriented. This one hurt a little bit, especially how early in the session it was. So a few orbits later, under the gun plus one raises to $25. And this time I'm in the hijack, relatively late position with pocket eights again. Definitely gonna call a pocket pair in position. No real reason to three bet because all better hands will happily call and most worse hands will fold. So we'll just call this one and the big blind calls as well. So we're going three ways to a flop of jack six, seven. Flopping only one over card to eights is a pretty good situation. Additionally, I have a backdoor straight draw, so that gives me some confidence with my specific hand. The preflop aggressor continues for $75. And for the reasons just stated, I'm not really gonna fold to just one bet, especially because he could have a lot of ace queen, ace king, ace tens here, and just shut down after one call if he doesn't improve. So this is a pretty easy call in position. The big blind folds and the turn is a beautiful eight of hearts. See, it's easy to flop sets of eights. You just gotta play them. Well, good news for me, my opponent does not slow down. He bets $130. Now at this point, I'm kind of narrowing him down to either over pairs or ace jack at the worst, but he probably has at least one pair here to bet two streets on a pretty dynamic board. He should never really have five, four or nine, 10 specifically. And although pocket jacks are possible, if we are set over set, it's just a cooler and we'll pay this man his money. The river is a board pairing jack. And when my opponent checks to me, it's time to put him on a hand range. I think he's very polar here, meaning he either has an over pair or air. He has aces, kings, queens, or he has ace, king, ace, queen, ace, 10. So theoretically, he should be able to call a bet of a larger size or he's gonna fold to any size anyway. So there's no real reason to go small or or milky with it. So I put out a bet of $425. Pretty much a pot size bet. Definitely player specific as both he's shown willingness to put money in the pot and he has the biggest stack at the table. So I don't expect calling a bet of this size to really be difficult for this particular player, but he eventually finds a fold. So, I mean, it's a good fold for that guy. I was probably a little too ambitious with that river bet, but is what it is. After a few days of reflecting, I understand his thought process. He's putting me on a jack when the board pairing jack comes. He just thinks that I called him two streets with a jack and then check folds because there's no flush draws that I could be repping on the flop. My bluffs do include like eight, nine, and I guess specifically seven, eight turned into a bluff once the board paired. But when you have a very narrow bluffing range and a very wide value range, you should probably bet a little bit smaller so it's easier for your opponents to call. Well, that's hindsight. Next hand of note. This one's a doozy. So it begins. Under the gun raises to $20. There are two calls to me and I'm on the button with pocket tens. Never gonna just call as I get to play in position and I have a relatively strong hand. So we're gonna go for a three bet and try to thin the field. Try to get a lot of the nonsense hands out of there. So I raised to $85. Well, surprisingly the big blind calls, the under the gun calls and under the gun plus two calls as well. So we're going four ways to a flop. Tens do not play very good four ways. I literally don't want to see a single card higher than a 10. And ironically, in this particular hand, 
any card higher than a 10 has me beat. Or ways to a flop, we get a 9-8 deuce board. So somehow we keep an over pair. When the players check to me, I'm gonna see bet most of my range here. Keep them in folly. If I had like ace king suited where I flop a backdoor flush, I would continue here as well as if I had all over pairs and maybe hands like nine, 10 that were creatively three betting. So I put out a half pot size bet. I bet $175 only under the gun plus two decides to call. So we're heads up to a turn card, which is the five of diamonds. Although six, seven gets there. And if he had eight, nine, he was beating me the whole time. When my opponent goes into the tank, it gives me time to think. I don't really know what it was, but the longer he took, the weaker I thought he was. I'm hoping to get stacks in with my specific hand and his specific stack size. Seeing he has about $600, I'm planning on doing 275 on the turn. So he's pretty much committed by the river. But my plans kind of go out the window when my opponent just open jams on me after a bit of thinking. That's a snap call yeah. from Kyle. Again, never folding here. I'm trying to get all the money in. When my opponent showed his hand, I only saw a pair of sevens and didn't really realize that he jammed with 14 outs, which isn't really doing that bad at all. But either way, we held and we took down one massive pot early on in the stream. That still only counts as one. A few hands later, with a button straddle, the big blind opens to $40, and I'm in the hijack with pocket kings. Precious. Definitely going to three bet this one as well. I make it $130. Well, the hijack is the only caller, and from my perspective, I can already see the ace in the window. Less than ideal. We are definitely going to see bet this board. I have more aces than he does. And I actually have the king of clubs for a flush draw in case my opponent happens to have outflopped me. So I bet $110. I mean, I wanted to bet $110, except I grabbed a green chip instead of a black chip. So, so doing a pretty silly mistake probably makes my hand almost face up. I expect my opponent to raise facing this a lot of the time as it's just ridiculous even though i'm pretty sure the solver would say a, a one fifth to a one sixth pot size bet might not even be bad here so either way as played we bet 35 into 280 and my opponent calls when the turn is a queen i think i can rep a lot of hands here i could have ace queen i could have pocket queens my exact hand of pocket kings i could have king 10 king jack with just the king of clubs i have so many hands here that turned a bunch of equity or even the best hand a lot of the time that this is what I'm definitely going to size up and try to get a weak ace, like ace 10 and lower to fold, maybe an ace wheel. So I bet $175 this time, and my opponent calls again. When the river is the five of spades, I think you can go both ways with this. I think you can turn your hand into a bluff as you do have the nut blocker, and that has a lot of power in this particular hand. My second barrel, I think, folds most weak aces, and I think if you're going to call the turn, you're pretty much saying you're calling the river as... The absolute nuts in the hand hadn't changed from the flop all the way through. So I actually think it's possible my opponent has exactly ace-queen and will just never fold, just side call even like a $500 bet. So I check it back thinking I'm going to lose nearly always and the old ace-jack offsuit, calling a three bet out of position. Right now, please take a moment and hit the subscribe button. It's very important you hit the subscribe button. I can't tell you why, it just is. All right then, keep your secrets. Next interesting hand involves me on the button for betting with ace queen off suit. I go into depth from this hand in my previous video. So if you want to hear the most optimal way to play a four bet pot, I would check that video out. The results of this hand were I did not win and it was very disappointing. And people often ask me when you get tilted at the table, when things aren't going your way, what do you do? I literally just get up and take a walk for about five minutes. We don't need to sit here and try to force things to get back to the highest profit level we were at. We can just clear our head, rethink some of the decisions we made, try to play good poker for the rest of the session because it's not over yet. After a bit of time where I felt a little more gathered, I come back and we're ready to play again. So the next hand of note. 
With a button straddle, I'm in the big blind with ace king of clubs. I raise to $40. Learn the gun player calls and the button calls as well. So we're going three ways to a flop of king seven deuce all hearts. Now on this monotone board, I think you can go two ways with it. You can block bet or you can check call because you're really not ever value betting on this particular board. Like yes, your ace king is probably good most of the time, but if you go for a sizing of like 100 into 120, the naked ace of hearts is calling anyway. They're calling any sizing. But in this particular hand, I decide to, to turn my hand in just a simple check call all the way down, barring any heart that comes. In the big blind, I check. Plus one bets 90. Again, we're just going for a check call all the way down. Turn is the eight of diamonds. Shouldn't really change anything. I think my opponent has a single ace or queen of hearts, so still gonna check call him down. I check, he checks it back. The river is the jack of spades. Some of the time I would consider going for some thin value here. I think king jack would play the exact same way, so, so I think checking is better because the ace of hearts may fire as a bluff right now. You increase the hands you can actually get value on by check calling because if you bet, king jack is always gonna call and a single ace of hearts is always gonna fold. So if you check, you give the ace of hearts a chance to bluff at it, which can get you some value in the long run. But as played, I checked. My opponent bets $250. Pretty easy call. And we win a decent sized pot. So we're pretty happy with that one. Against the same opponent, with a button straddle, it folds to me in the hijack. I raise to $30 with king jack off suit. The button is the only caller. And when the flop is jack high, relatively coordinated, I think this board actually connects with the button's defending range better than my hijack raising range. Additionally, this opponent's shown the willingness to put in the bets for me. So as in this hand, when I'm out of position, I think that I can check call him down again. So I check, my opponent bets 30, I call. Turn is a nine, it's pretty bad. It coordinates the board, a lot of two pairs get there. King, queen exactly is a very possible straight that got there. But when I check, my opponent checks back. And the river is another nine. So very, very confident I have the best hand here. Can still just check call because with my specific hand, if I bet and then get raised, I pretty much have to fold. And my opponent can have a very liberal raising range. He can have ace five of hearts and raise, and as well as he could have eight, nine off suit and raise. It isn't the craziest of hands. I think hands like this are really good as they strengthen your checking range, as well as the fact that they gave you a lot of table credibility. Like if your opponents look at you and see you'll check top pair, and now all of a sudden you're betting, your betting likely will have a lot more credibility in the future as you're gaining a very, very tight table image. So for a final hand of note, I look down at the greatest hand of the session, pocket eights. There's no way I'm not flopping a set with this hand. I raised to $20. Well, only the hijack calls, so we're going heads up to a flop with only one overcard to pocket eights and plenty of draws that can pay me off, like club draws and straight draws. Definitely going to bet this possibly multiple streets. I start out with a $25 wager. My opponent calls pretty quickly. When the turn is the queen of clubs, that's a pretty bad card as I'm hoping to be against club draws. So the fact that that gets there, going to have to slow down a lot of the time. I check my opponent checks it back. River is the seven of clubs, and it's a pretty bad run out as I went from an 84% favorite to losing. So hands like this happen. They do affect the win rates, but you literally just can't let them bother you. You just have to move on to the next one. That was close to the last hand of the night. We finished the session plus $709, which I thought was a pretty good result as it's a four hour stream. All right, if you watched all the way to this point, thank you. I appreciate it. Please consider hitting the like and subscribe button, and there will be more to come next week.